Welcome everybody, I'm Camila Gaido, and today I'm going to talk about resonant web application over a fringing race, which is part of the thesis I did at TU Delft. Nowadays I'm working at UCSD and USGS on a similar topic. Fringe and reef occur around low-lying islands, which are known to be highly vulnerable to flooding. Here you can see an example of a low-lying island, which is beach, and fronted by a fringe and reef with the reef flat, the reef crest, and a sharp fore reef. Long waves, also known as infragravity waves, are dominant in this environment, and they drive the shoreline motion at these beaches. Under certain conditions, these waves have been seen to be able to resonate over the reef flat, leading to disproportionately amplified water levels at the shoreline. Long waves traveling over the reef, due to its sharp asymmetry, can be reflected at the beach and reflected back at the fore reef, leading to travel of energy over the reef flat. In addition, the period of the wave T matches the natural period of the reef Tn, this can lead to resonant wave amplification. As you can see here, the natural period of the reef depends on the width of the reef and the water level over the reef flat. There are different resonant modes, and in this presentation, we're gonna focus in the fundamental mode T0 and the first mode T1. Both periods for typical fringing reef geometries are in the order of long waves. So our main question is, what are the processes limiting the long wave resonant amplification over a fringing reef? For this, we developed numerical experiment using the non-aerostatic wave resolving model SWASH. We built an schematized 1D fringing reef profile as the one you can see here, with its beach slope, a reef flat with a width of 270 meter, and a water depth over the reef of 0.8 meter, and finalizing on a four reef slope. We use low water friction, much lower than the normal one found in coral reefs. We use a simplified uh, wave climate of long regular waves with periods between 120 and 500 seconds. And this range includes both resonant period of our fringing reef, T0 and T1. We also use a small wave amplitudes between 0.1 and 1.5 centimeters. We use a small wave amplitude because in order to use swash, you need to have linear wave conditions at the wave maker, which is here. And that's why also we needed to extend our reef until 440 meters. Here you can see an example of the outputs of our wave modeling. We focus uh, and did a zoom here at the reef flat. And you can see here the water levels for the fundamental mode. You can see how the first wave came. And also here you can see how a standing wave pattern is forming. And it's also important to notice that this water level is amplifying in time until it will reach a maximum marked by this dashed line that it will be under stationary conditions. If now we focus in a particular position, in this case, the beach toe, which is between the reef flat and the beach, you can see the surface elevation as a function of time. And you can distinguish two patterns. The first one between zero and around 5,000 seconds, we call it the resonance build up time, which is the time resonance needs to be able to reach a maximum amplification. After this time, uh, stationary conditions start, and you can see how the wave amplification um, remains constant in time. In this presentation, we're going to divide uh, our topic in these two parts. First, we're going to talk about the stationary results. And I want you to remember that when we talk about wave uh, Hmax, it's the maximum wave height at the beach toe, and it's the total wave height, meaning the incoming wave height plus the outgoing wave height. And after the stationary conditions, we're going to talk about resonance field up time. So for stationary results, here you can see the maximum wave height and the maximum run up air max as a function of the period. We model this for a offshore condition of um, one centimeter. And here you can see that two peaks are formed. 
the first mode T1 and the fundamental mode T0. It's important to notice that if you compare the wave height and the runout, they behave similarly. And also that the fundamental mode amplifies more than the first mode. Therefore, now onwards, we're going to focus on the fundamental mode and the wave height H max. After finding the most resonant period, we wanted to understand how um, the amplification varies according to the, in, the offshore wave height. And for this, we studied the maximum incoming wave height at the beach toe, H max in, you can see here, as a function of the offshore wave height. What we found here is that the smallest wave, which is 0 0.1 centimeter, amplifies 20 times when reaching the beach toe, uh, leading to a 2 centimeter wave height. Also, we found here that for our largest wave of 1.5 centimeters, you can reach close to 20 centimeters of wave height at the beach toe. And this is only the incoming wave height, which is around, if you compare with the water depth, is around 25% of the water depth of 80 centimeters. But now, if you think about the total wave height, which is around two times the maximum incoming wave height, you will get around 40 centimeters of wave height at the beach toe. In comparing again to the water depth of 80 centimeters, it means that it's reaching a, a wave height of 50% uh, of the water depth. We want also to understand the relative resonant amplification. And for this, we wanted to compare how much this wave is amplifying compared to the expected wave height at the beach toe only due to linear wave shoaling, which is, is this, uh, the variation of the wave height due to the change of water depth. And what we found here is that when you compare H max and divided by the H show as a function of offshore wave height, you will see that smaller waves amplify more than larger waves. And they can even reach 4.2 times larger wave heights than the expected only due to wave shoaling. So we were thinking, why is this happening? And we decided to study the influence of friction on this. So we model exactly the same waves, but now for a frictional model. And what we found here is that when you remove friction, you get larger amplifications, which was expected because friction helps to the re reduce the resonant amplification. And what we also found here is that also as expected, this friction has a larger influence on larger wave heights. But what we found here, something unexpected, is that if you um, analyze the, the results, you can see there are two patterns of resonant uh, wave amplification. The first one, before a certain offshore wave height, you have an increase of wave amplification while increasing the offshore wave height. But after this wave height, you have a decrease of wave amplification when increasing the offshore wave height, which is a similar behavior as the one we found um, in the model with friction, which are the blue dots. So it seems that friction plays a role, of course, but some another process must be playing a role that is determining how these waves are amplifying. And we will come back to this later. Now we want to show our results for the non-stationary uh, part of our time series, which we call the resonant delta time. And this refers to the time of number of waves resonant needs to reach a maximum amplification. And this is relevant because it puts time as a limiting factor for resonance to occur. Here you can see the numbers of waves you need for different offshore wave heights to be able to reach the maximum amplification. On the upper panel, you see the fundamental mode and the lower panel, you see the first mode. And the dots are showing when this maximum amplification is reached. What we found with this is that you need for both periods between 10 to 20 waves to reach this maximum resonant amplification, which in terms of times means that for the fundamental mode, you need between one and two and a half hours of build on time to reach a maximum amplification. And for the first mode, you need between 30 to 45 minutes of build on time. We also found that larger waves amplify faster than smaller waves. Also interesting is to notice that if now you think about reaching only 90% of the maximum wave amplification, 
you will find that you need around half of the time. So as conclusions, a smaller waves amplify relatively more than higher waves. However, they take more time to reach this amplification. Also, for the, for the largest incoming wave we consider, you only need five waves to reach the 90% of the maximum amplification, which is around 12 minutes for the first mode and 35 minutes for the fundamental mode, which puts resonance as a more realistic phenomenon to occur. And also important to notice is that even low water friction, as the one we use here, can strongly, strongly reduce resonant amplification. And as expected, this was extra, uh, stronger on higher waves. So as next steps, if you remember this figure, we wanted to understand, we want to understand how, why is this behavior changing after a certain offshore wave height? And we think this is related to the influence of nonlinearities on resonant amplification. So here, you also see a water level um, with a zooming of the reef flat as the one we see before, we saw before, but here for the um, largest wave height we model. And if you see here, you can see the first wave coming, just as before, and all you can see, also can see as the standing wave pattern is forming, and as the amplification is increasing with time. You can also notice how this um, reflective wave keeps deepening after being reflected. And after a while, we can see how undulations are formed over this long wave. And they seem to be able to escape the reef. So we were wondering, can this have an effect on the trap wave energy over the reef? And can this have an effect on the resonant amplification than you can get for different offshore wave heights. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you.